morning and welcome to the bucket courses. Everything you want to know before you kick the bucket. We're glad to see you here and I know you'll be glad that you came. My name is Barb Lees and here are some things you need to know before we start. Please silence your cell phones. Please turn on your T coil if you have one. If there is discussion or time for questions, we'll come around with the microphones. Please wait for the microphones because that allows the people with T coils to hear the question. Um, and if you're able at the end um, to help, you could put up your chairs on the dollies at the front and the back of the room. Now for the main event. We are happy to have Jim Kessler back with us today. Jim has devoted his professional life to science education, teaching biology to young people for 45 years, and now teaching those of us who have a few more years under our belts. Jim recognizes the importance of native plant habitats to our environment and promotes this idea in presentations and workshops all over the country. Today, he'll teach us how to create biodiversity at home, in our own yards, and in our own neighborhoods. Please join me in welcoming back Jim Kessler. And thank you. Uh, our county, uh, county Powhashik County naturalist asked that I put this slide up. There is a wildflower walk in Fleming's Woods State Park uh, State Preserve uh, southwest of Montezuma on Thursday and Friday, the 21st and 22nd. And I'm sure that's a beautiful area. I need to visit it. I haven't. So I'll get out of that and get into my presentation. Well, this is nice. Not. Oh, okay. I'll get it. And I'll get it, that taken care of. Uh, today, I will talk, uh, actually, Jordan Scheibel and I, several years ago, put together a series of presentations called the Green Yard Makeover. And Jordan did the uh, vegetable garden part of this. But, and I will focus on the native plant uh, part of it. Integrating native plants like F.E. Hall talked about last week is really uh, with, you know, what you already have in your yard is, is a good way to go. The green yard makeover concept, and this is just a model and it's not, uh, nobody's going to do it exactly this way, obviously, but uh, it includes uh, some butterfly gardens, uh, an or possibly an organic garden with raised beds, and I'll explain why you can put a prairie strip across that to help with your insect control. Also, a privacy border along the edge of the yard. I also help people with larger native plantings but uh, actually in NRCS and, and, uh, the local ext and the extension service are very helpful with that kind of thing as well. Here's a butterfly garden in a yard uh, with, uh, with those are, uh, well, there are several kinds of wildflowers. They're not all blooming at this point and some of the native grasses. And, and I like this picture because these particular plants are relatively short, which often is very helpful in keeping good relations with neighbors in town. Uh, here's a organic garden with, or a garden with raised beds and uh, native tree and shrub borders, which can be very, very beautiful. It's important to put native plants in, into the mix in all of these and I'll explain why. And it's not just for pollinators. The inspiration for this uh, idea came from a couple of sources. 
Doug Ptolemy's Homegrown National Park, uh, which in which he encourages people to transform half of the yards with native plants, half of the yard acreage, to support pollinators, songbirds, wildlife, and so on. And it's incredibly important that we do this. The other inspiration came from Iowa State University's Prairie Strips program, where they put 10% uh, of a crop field into uh, native plantings on the contour. And this is supported through uh, the farm program. Uh, with incredible results. In the studies at Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge that ISU did, they got 40% less runoff, 95% 95, uh, 95 less soil leaving the field. That's a pretty big deal. And uh, a huge amount of the fertilizer stayed in the field instead of going down into the streams. There was 84% less nitrogen leaving the field and 90% less phosphorus leaving the field. The pollinator crisis is something that we've all experienced. I mean, we used to drive our cars down the road and we had to clean off the windshields because of the insects hitting the, uh, you know, hitting the glass and, and our... Uh, grills in front. Native pollinator populations are declining in part because non-native flowers, lawn gr grasses, and crop fields just don't provide much food. Any, they don't provide almost any food for them. 80% of our flowering plants, most of our current vegetation require pollination to produce seed and would face eventual extinction without pollinators. If we wipe out our pollinators, future generations will likely say goodbye to fresh garden tomatoes, jack-o'-lanterns at Halloween, and pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. Uh, that would be a very sad event. We've lost over half of the uh, weight of insects in the world at this point in the last 40 years. And we can't let that go on. We're rapidly moving in that direction. Planting pollinator habitat can reverse this trend. It's kind of a bottom-up thing that lots of people need to do. This presentation is designed to equip you with practical knowledge about how we all can help to reverse this trend. So what would be left here without pollinators? I got Jack-o'-lanterns at Halloween, watermelons, pumpkin pie, apples, cucumbers, oranges, grapes, peas, squash, almonds, blueberries, cherries, tomatoes, muskmelons, carrots, strawberries, corn, and green beans. Take a guess. Now let's look. It's the ones that are either self-pollinated like peas and soybeans or a corn and green beans. Uh, beans are, and are also self-pollinated. Corn and rice and some of the major food crops are wind-pollinated because they are in the grass family. Our choices about what we plant will impact the food supply and health of future generations and life on this planet. So what part of our food supply requires insect pollination? You're looking at the produce aisle here. Make some guesses. Well, actually, uh, people use the guess a, little, a bit high. It's, it's a third of our food supply, but it's the Fruits and vegetables are things that keep us healthy. And in places where people don't have them, the health consequences and the cost to our health care system are huge. To have healthy food, you need pollinators. 
And pollinators cannot exist without native plants, at least not to the point we have. The other problem, of course, is herbicides, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Saving pollinators really isn't optional, and the way to do that is to plant native wildflowers and grasses. I had a wake-up moment a few years ago. We live on uh, 30 acres. Uh, we've donated uh, all, all but two acres ar uh, that are around our house to the Baroque Land Trust in Iowa City for long-term management and protection. And uh, out in front of our house, there's a fence row with lots of trees, and most of them are native trees. And one fall, went outside in the evening, and the tr tree crickets were going nuts. It was really loud out there. I went to the prairie, right, in the east field and listened and the field crickets and Katie dids were going nuts there. It was super loud. I thought, I'll walk over to my neighbor's cornfield. What do you suppose I heard? Dead silence. And that is our, although our herbicides are incredibly helpful in producing food, herbicides and pesticides, they create a situation where pretty much nothing can grow in those fields or survive in those fields except for corn and soybeans. And that's a big chunk of Iowa. A big, big chunk of Iowa and this county. Green yard makeover can be uh, flexible and adaptable. It creates habitat, it can provide food for a family if somebody plant if people plant a vegetable garden in the yard uh, actually converting half of a yard can save up to thousands of dollars for other uses in a decade it reduces expensive equipment and maintenance costs and obviously reduces fertilizer herbicide and pesticide costs that are used on most lawns now we're going to compare I'm going to compare how, what the difference is between the benefits of having native plants in, in part of your lawn and the impacts of turf lawn and alien trees and shrubs, which a lot of people have in their yard, especially in these new developments. They put in Bradford pear and other things that our pollinators really can't use and uh, that are non-natives. So you have reduced maintenance costs, Reduce grocery bills if you plant a garden. This frees money for other uses. In a turf lawn, there's, there are high maintenance costs, mowers, fuel, water, repairs, fertilizer, pesticides, and herbicides that are involved. Uh, a green yard makeover creates more time for recreation. Gardens provide exercise and promote better health. Lawn care reduces personal time for recreation. I had a neighbor, have a neighbor, well, I did have a neighbor who's moved on since who spent countless hours riding his lawnmower, which to me is one of the most boring activities <laughs> created on the planet. Uh, it reduces stormwater runoff, flooding and water pollution from lawn chemicals, which is a problem in Iowa. Large amounts of stormwater runoff. It's amazing out, out how much comes off a roof, home roof, and goes out into the uh, streams and waterways from Grinnell. More lawn, and you get more lawn chemical pollution going out into the streams and waterways. A green yard makeover increases butterfly, pollinator, and songbird species and individuals present in your yard. The typical turf lawn does the opposite. It decreases those populations. Uh, it increases, uh, the green yard makeover increases critical wildlife habitat, creates, and a turf lawn creates a food desert for wildlife. 
uh, a green yard makeover with na native plants and part of the yard can in include food plants for endangered monarchs and other butterflies. Green yard makeover or a uh, turf lawn provides little or no food for monarchs and other butterflies, practically none. Adding native plants to a yard provides, uh, or actually a vegetable garden provides food for families uh, and a turf lawn provides no food for families. A green yard makeover supports beneficial insects that control insect pests. A turf lawn requires chemicals to control insect pests. At least that's what most people do. And uh, to keep the lawn going. Privacy borders provide shade and enjoyable outdoor spaces. And host plants for butterfly gar uh, larvae that are what songbirds feed to their babies so that they can reproduce. Turf lawn is designed for looks, but a lot of times people don't use it for any kind of personal pursuits. Uh, a green yard makeover, in that setting you can enjoy the refreshing and invigorating sights of sounds and nature. Turf lawn, get a lot of stressful machine noises that dull your senses, and they'll be starting pretty soon in Grinnell. So one of the things that you can do is to plant uh, butterfly gardens. Uh, and if you don't have a vegetable garden, you can plant them anyway. But planting them along the edge of vegetable gardens supports insect predators and pollinators that can help the garden. I had a friend a few years ago who lived in Grinnell, uh, and he said his uh, squash were not getting pollinated and they weren't developing. And I, you know what I told him. <laughs> plant, some plant a butterfly garden and you won't have a problem getting your crops uh, pollinated in your vegetable garden. Now here's something that very few people know about. Those little black beetles that are, uh, sometimes cr uh, crawl across sidewalks are voracious insect predators. Actually, their larvae feed on insects underground. And then uh, during, uh, especially at night, they go out and feed on insects above ground. Now this is from the Grinnell Heritage uh, Farm, which isn't operational now, but uh, anyway, they had a strip of little blue stem through the field. It doesn't take a lot to get these into action. And they are very helpful in reducing the amount of insect pests in a garden. And big blue stem, or little blue stem, isn't a really tall plant, a grass. So for butterfly gardens or pollinator gardens, whatever you want to call them, uh, there are some things that I'll go over, and some of this I'll repeat later. Uh, redundancy is helpful. <laughs> People learn that way. Uh, this is a, the garden map that I set up for the Grinnell Friends Church uh, Butterfly Garden that's uh, along Highway 146 in front of the church south of town. Uh, Site preparation is important. Now, there are many ways to do this. You can do it with cardboard. You can do it with herbicides. You can do it lots of ways. Uh, this is uh, one called solarization. Get some plastic from a, a greenhouse in the spring when they or whenever they replace their plastic and recycle it. These are some of the things you have to do with that. It must be clear plastic. It has to be put on in late May or June after cold nights have stopped. I know Effie did, I think Effie did this, right? You did it. Uh, you've done it before. And take it off in September before the cold nights start. Keep the edges secure, no airflow. Now, yeah, you can do it with black plastic. Uh, this 
supposedly helps to reduce the amount of weeds in the top inch of the soil. Now, there are weeds down lower that will appear anyway, but it can reduce the weed uh, pressure when you plant somewhat. Starting native seedlings. Again, I'm going to show you about three ways to do it. The first one I have pictures of that I because I did it at home, uh, and I've uh, I'm not using this method anymore, but it's it is instructive. Uh, you take uh, have some water, some white sand if you can get a hold of that. That can be a problem. That's why I'm not using it anymore, and some uh, native plant seeds. They have to you have to break the dormancy of many of the native seeds. You know, they lay out in the winter time and they get they freeze and thaw and then they're ready to go in the spring. This particular one has to go in the refrigerator for uh, C30 means it goes in the refrigerator for a month for 30 days. Uh, you put some moisture in the sand. Don't get it too wet, but put some moisture in there. Put the seeds in and then put it in the refrigerator for the amount of time that it tells you on the package. This is another easier way to do it, much easier with uh, coffee filters. And uh, the thing they don't show on here is they often recommend to put in a, a paper towel or another coffee filter to absorb some of the moisture so the seeds don't get too wet and, and it causes some molding. Uh, this is another, and uh, they're number, this is becoming more popular. People cut milk jugs, they poke holes in them, then they put the soil in and moisten it, and then uh, put the seeds in. Now they've left a cap on here, they, uh, which a lot of people don't do. You may have to rewater if there isn't any snow or rain in the winter, much snow or rain in the winter time like we've had this year. You seal up the milk jug, put it outside, and wait for them to sprout and then transplant them, which makes sense to me. It takes some time to get the milk jugs. <laughs> that that takes some effort. Now here are some seedlings. These are some seedlings that I started for the butterfly garden out at Grinnell French Church. Uh, now I have containers uh, because I've dealt with many plants for a long time. You can use any kind of container to start many plants. You don't need anything fancy. Here they were a month, and a month, month and a half later, ready to be planted. Um, okay, now that ends part one. Do you have any questions? And I, I know this isn't normal, but we'll take just a little bit of time, two or three questions, and then I'll move on. If you want to stand and stretch, you can do that, but that's up to you. My question is, uh, how effective is just harvesting native seeds and then going throwing them out in your native prairie after you've burned it? What percent was it uh, start? Actually, I, I have done that. Uh, anyway, Daryl Smith, who started the Tallgrass Prairie Center at UNI, was somebody that I knew because of graduate school at UNI. And uh, I called him one time, and he said, you can do that, but you're going to have to get for it to be effective, you need to mow strips in there or mow the prairie for a couple of years. Uh, what I did was to sow them and then I I just went in and with my uh, brush hog or platform mower and mowed strips in the in the prairie and uh, I've had I had pretty good results with that. Actually some of the areas were almost nothing but grass and they turn they really are lush with wildflowers now. So that can be done after an initial planting to add to the number of wildflowers for pollinators. Uh, I mowed it actually when I did that I mowed it throughout the growing season about oh six inches foot high. 
just to let sunlight in so that seedlings could start. Okay, is that it? Let's go on. And I've got to get this queued up. Okay, this is part two. Recommended native plants for butterfly gardens. Um, and again, they can go anywhere in the yard. It's not... This is just a, a model <laughs> on, uh, on a slide. However, putting native plants into a yard can be done in very attractive ways as, as Effie showed you last time, if you were here. Here are some native plants for full sun, the partially shaded butterfly garden. It's in you know, it's not just butterflies and monarchs, it's also pollinators, other pollinators that need these. Here are some of the wildflowers. Now, a lot of these are really gorgeous. I have picked, I, these are shorter wildflowers. They're not the tall ones. Anna's hyssop is a butterfly magnet. Now, I won't guarantee that you'll have this many monarchs on it, but it is a, a butterfly magnet. And it uh, attracts lots of uh, lots of uh, insects and and pollinators of various types, uh, and it blooms sometime during the summer. I, I think it's more of a July one. Uh, Nodding onion comes in early late July, early August. And it's a good plant for borders. Uh, because it doesn't get real tall and it doesn't have thick leaves. Butterfly milkweed, of course, is a wonderful plant. There are some of the milkweeds I don't mention because they spread underground through rhizomes and they will take over the garden. If you want a, it to look like a garden, a regular milkweed spreads underground. And, and some of the others that I don't mention spread underground and that can be a problem in a garden. It's not a problem in a prairie, of course. Uh, swamp milkweed or rose milkweed is another really beautiful plant that attracts lots of, uh, it, it attracts the monarchs and other pollinators. And I have, so I have both of those out in the uh, butterfly garden out at the church. There's a, a fall uh, blooming plant that blooms late. The calico aster is a nice one. Silky aster is another one that comes really late in the fall before things free, as things are starting to get a little cooler. Uh, side oats grandma, which is planted in front of this building on the, the uh, s uh, south side of the library, is a good one. Now, one thing I'll say about grasses, because of my experience with butterfly gardens, don't plant them in the middle of the butterfly garden because the other plants will crowd them out in most cases. If you, if you plant the wildflowers close together, uh, they just overwhelm the short grasses. So I tend to put those on, would put those on the edges, uh, not the front edge necessarily, so you can see over them. Uh, Sedges are, have triangular stems, and they are very beautiful. Uh, this one uh, is a pretty common one in this area, Plains Oval Sedge. That's kind of neat flower heads. Uh, yeah, they don't have petals, but those are flower heads. Uh, Pericoreopsis is a nice one. Now, again, this spreads underground. And, but it's pretty easy to pull and weed in a garden to keep it from taking over. And it's not really tall, so uh, it's, it's fine in a butterfly garden. A shooting star comes early. Uh, they're gorgeous. Uh, you, anyway, that, that's one possibility. And I'm showing you mostly plants that are two foot or shorter because of public perception. 
Uh, people don't like, you know, people get worried about uh, looks and they get worried about lions and other predators bother, uh, you know, coming after them if something is too so tall, other than trees. Bottle gentian, this is important for uh, some of our large bumblebees. They uh, force their way into this plant and it comes in late fall. I love prairie smoke. Comes very early in the spring. Uh, it uh, is somewhat of a ground cover. It's not very big, and and it's a great plant to put on the border of a uh, butterfly garden. I've had great results with it. Wild geranium is another one, and it can go both in the shade and in uh, the sun. Uh, Missouri Evening Primrose. Now this is a great ground cover. Produces lots of blooms. They come out in the morning and then fade in the afternoon on a sunny day. But they have big blooms and they bloom for a long time and they cover quite a bit of, gr of territory. And they are gorgeous plants and they're really short. They hug the ground. Prairie Sundrops is a re another relative of, that's of the Prim in the primrose family. Uh, it's a bit daintier. And then some, this one, foxglove beard tongue. And of course this, ha this has a bumblebee uh, feeding on it. This comes in early June and it's a really gorgeous plant. There are some other foxgloves, one that's I think purple, which is really nice in a butterfly garden as well. I don't have it uh, queued up in this presentation. White prairie clover and purple prairie clover come in June and into early July and are blooming then. Uh, mountain mint is, again, it, it's a gorgeous plant. It is a butterfly, mag or it is a pollinator magnet. Here's a honeybee on it. Uh, and it is, uh, it's also rhizomatous, which means it spreads by stems underground. So sometimes you gotta pull some around the edges of where you want it to keep it where you want it. But it's a great plant. And with some of those, I just recommend that people don't put huge numbers of plants in to begin with. Uh, wild phlox or prairie phlox is a great, is a early plant. Comes early in the season. Here's one that I love, and you can use it as a ground cover. Wild petunia has this gorgeous lavender flower, um, and it sp it shoots out seeds, and so it spreads, and I just kind of let it go in butterfly gardens as a ground cover. It only gets about eh, eight inches tall or so, and it uh, doesn't out-compete other plants, but I love it. It will spread into lawns if you don't mow your lawn. But if you mow uh, the lawn around it, no problem. A little blue stem uh, is, an, is one of the shorter prairie grasses. Again, planted around an edge. Showy goldenrod. This is, a, this is pretty much a must for uh, a butterfly garden because this is a plant the other go uh, goldenrods are very aggressive and they will take over a garden. This one stands up nicely by itself uh, and it uh, attracts lots of pollinators and I really love it. Uh, it uh, attracts an amazing number of pollinators and bees and uh, so on getting ready for winter. That's late fall. Uh, Northern Prairie Drop Seed Really cool plant. Again, don't put it in the middle of the garden. I did out at the church, and you can't find it anymore because it's been crowded out. Hoary vervain is a possibility. We used to find those in pastures. Now, I will tell you ahead of time, you, you need to deadhead these plants before they go to seed. I usually do it about in the gardens that I manage about three times a year. Uh, Golden Alexander, this can ta also take over, uh, but it's a very beautiful early plant. Comes in late May, early June. Uh, 
plant it sparingly and you'll be happy. Uh, okay, now some people will leave this part out. And I will repeat some of this, so please understand there will be some redundancy here. A lot of people leave out some of the other plants that help the pollinators and the butterflies especially, shrubs. No, you don't put this right next to a butterfly garden. But a shrub, a native shrub in the yard can be really, really helpful. Uh, this one is uh, service berry or june berry. Another was New Jersey tea, which my son put along the back row, uh, back fence line of his uh, property or of his uh, yard, which is not far from here. It's, it's out toward the edge of town, and it, it it attracts small pollinators, and it's a really gorgeous plant. Sometimes hummingbirds will come up to this because the the little uh, flies that pollinate it are there and they feed on them sometimes. Uh, red Aussie or dogwoods, another one. Hazelnut. Don't plant it thinking that you're going to get nuts. The, the squirrels and the other critters will beat you to them unless you check it <laughs> twice a day. <laughs> Uh, nanny berry is another possibility. These are all uh, mostly native to this exact locale. There are, I think, red Aussie or dogwood isn't, but it's a very gorgeous plant. Uh, native plants for shaded butterfly and pollinator gardens. Now, why do I put this in? A lot of people say I have a tree in their yard that provides shade. You can plant a butterfly garden with shade-loving plants around under that tree, anywhere in your yard. And that's a concept that most people go, oh yeah, I gotta mow that. Well, no, not necessarily. And, and it's often a pain to mow, because you got, especially if it's an older tree. Uh, this is a possibility. Do not plant columbine in a sunny location in a butterfly garden. It's gorgeous. You will fight it because it will spread all over the garden. You got to get out there in uh, sometime in June, or, well, late May and June, and deadhead them, or you'll have it everywhere. It's the worst weed that I have in the butterfly garden at Newton High School. <laughs> and it's a native plant, because I planted it in the sun, plant it in the shade, and it doesn't cause a problem. Wild leek is another one. Uh, jack in the pulpit. You don't have to have an intense woods to have jack in the pulpit. Uh, shorts aster comes in the fall. Wild ginger is a wonderful ground cover in the shade. And it, the, you don't see the flowers, but the leaves are very interesting and, uh, and enjoyable to look at. Lady fern's a possibility, oak sedge. This is my favorite sedge. It's just gorgeous. I've tried to take pictures of it that actually show what it looks like and how enjoyable it is to look at. I never have been able to succeed. It kind of does the Dutch boy haircut thing in the middle, and it's, it's great. I love it. And it's a very interesting plant. Um, that grows, it grows wild around here, but again, uh, put it in a location where it won't block the view because it can get, it gets at least a foot tall. Wild geranium can go both in the sun and in the shade, and you can plant it under the shade of trees that are already are in your yard. Prairie smoke doubles up also. This one, <sighs> Really, if I have a favorite grass, native grass, this is it. Bottle brush grass, looks, the, the seed head looks like a bottle brush. And uh, it, will, it does really well on edges that get partial shade and sun. Uh, blue, Virginia bluebells, uh, if you transplant them in, I actually have some in a fence row. 
in front of the house and they'll be blooming before too much longer and they are absolutely gorgeous and they are spreading as they do go to seed and I want them to in that location but they can be planted under a tree in the shade under the dri uh, drip line uh, foxglove beard time can double up in the sun and shade uh, Jacob's ladder is another one it uh, again this is a sh not a real tall plant so you probably want it out toward the edge of whatever you're planting. The common blue violets, they come on before pretty much anything else, a lot of other plants, uh, when there aren't any leaves on trees and bloom. And they are, uh, there are certain, as I mentioned last time, there's one great spangled fertilizer butterfly can't survive without these. That's what its larvae feed on. That's what they lay their eggs on. Uh, okay, and that's the end of part two. Why don't we take our 10-minute break? And if you have questions, I'll turn this thing off and come around and, yeah. Okay, 10-minute break. Listen for the bell. Turning promptly, once again, Jim Kessler. Uh, somebody just asked me, can you grow some of these in a pot? Yeah on your on your deck or you know wherever you're at some people are at uh, retirement homes situations where they don't have a place to plant otherwise you can they you probably may have to repot them occasionally i would encourage you in that kind of situation to plant some butterfly milkweed or some of the some of the plants that attract monarchs and other butterflies uh, this is a part, one of the things that I often say, a lot of people go, we got to plant a huge number of trees to combat climate change. I don't disagree. The problem is trees don't belong everywhere. Uh, shrubs don't belong everywhere. Habitats are different in different parts of the world. What I try to tell people is you need to plant habitat with all of the elements in it. Does that make sense? I mean, if you're in, uh, if you're in, uh, you know, southern Texas or western Texas, you probably need to plant a xeriscape with plants that require very little water. Uh, so, yeah, we need lots of trees, we need lots of shrubs, we need lots of plants that belong where they belong. We need habitats. I, you know, I, I have nothing against tree plantings, and I encourage people to do those, but I always wish that they would add some, over time, once the trees get big enough, to add some shrubs and some wildflowers, native wildflowers and grasses underneath so that they end up with, a, with an entire habitat that supports all of life. And, for example, in, I know in Australia they planted a lot of non-native fast-growing trees and now they're having trouble with wildflower, uh, wildfires in those locations. Uh, you want natives because that's what supports life. Uh, now we'll look at a, uh, a lot of people have trees on borders and yards. And so, you know, people will plant trees. A lot of times they don't add the shrubs, and, uh, and very few people add the wildflowers and grasses. Uh, in a, again, this can be done with, uh, you know, non-native wildflowers that uh, we buy and that we love to have in our yards that are very beautiful. It, uh, all this can be mixed together. Uh, but, and nut and fr fruit tree plants, nut and fruit trees and, and shrubs and so on can be added to a border. Privacy borders can be incredibly beautiful. I mean, very wealthy people usually have privacy borders. If you go to places where they live, unless they're in the middle of a development and then it isn't, 
anywhere to be seen. Part of the catch, my wife is a birder. She feeds birds and she has bluebird boxes and the whole nine yards. I do the habitat thing. Uh, restoration is my, my gig and hers is birds. And she has feeds a lot of birds. We go through an amazing amount of bird seed. And people ask her, why do you get, how do you get all these kinds of birds? Well, we have a fence row in front of our house and it has most of these layers in it. It has tall trees, a little bit lower trees, understory or shorter trees, a shrub, some shrubs, and wildflowers and grasses, native wildflowers and grasses. You need the whole package over time to help wildlife of all kinds. Layers of native plants provide food and habitat for songbirds and butterflies. They need shaded places. They need food for their babies. They need places to nest. They need places to hide from predators. They, uh, you know, it, one thing I didn't mention last week, in our prairies, my wife gets kind of upset in the fall because the, and in the winter, uh, because the birds don't come to our bird feeders unless it snows very much. Because they're out in the prairies and, and out in the native habitats collecting the good seed that doesn't cost anything. <laughs> so these are our top native trees that support butterfly and moth caterpillars that feed our songbirds and other wildlife. Oaks are number one. Willows are number two. That one gets a little tricky because most of our native willows need wet spots. If you have a wet spot, that's okay. If you don't, then there are a lot of, there are non-native willows that you can get at nurseries and they don't do much of anything for wildlife for what I'll talk about. Plums and cherries are great. Uh, the natives, wild cherries are incredible and the, and the birds flock to them. Cot um, excuse me, cottonwood, if you get a male plant, for obvious reasons, because you don't want all that fur flying around and having to clean it up every year. Crab apples are excellent. Maples are down the list of ways. Uh, elms, if you, now you can buy, I don't have any experience with them, you can buy hybrid elms that are resistant to the Dutch elm disease. Uh, hickories are great, hawthorns, I'll talk about those later, and uh, basswood are all good possibilities because those, those are trees that insect caterpillars uh, feed on. And that's where the butterflies and moths lay their eggs for the most part. There, there are other plants that they lay their eggs on as well. Okay, we're going to look at migratory songbirds and the issues that, they're con that confront them. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize. When I first learned this, it took me back. But let's stay on the lighter side for a moment. A daddy bird, a mommy bird, and a baby bird were ready to migrate. The daddy bird said, my instincts tell me to go north. The mommy bird said, no way. My instincts tell me to go south. The baby bird looked puzzled and said, my instincts too, but it doesn't tell me where to go. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the real world, migratory songbird populations have declined 1% annually since 1966. We really don't notice this because it's 1% a year. You add that all up, and that's almost 50 years, or it's over 50 years, we have lost over half of the, of the songbird numbers uh, in Iowa and across the country. Most people have no clue that that's happened because it's such a subtle thing. Uh, since we have less native plants, 
and insect caterpillars in our landscapes, many young birds starve. I mean, l turf lawns and cornfields are great. Uh, you know, the cornfields are great for feeding uh, livestock and people, but they're food deserts for birds. So we need to find a common ground. This decline is happening because songbirds need insect caterpillars that are found mainly on native plants and shrub leaves to feed their young. This is pretty amazing. To raise one clutch of young, one set of babies, a pair of chickadees have to collect 6,000 to 9,000 insect caterpillars. They bring in an insect caterpillar to the nest every three minutes. They go out, they find holes in the leaves, that's where the caterpillars are, and, and they bring them in, you know, little birds need baby food, soft baby food, of course, just like babies do. Uh, most lawns and, and our agricultural fields are food deserts for birds. Since we have less native plants and insect caterpillars in our landscapes, many young birds starve. The vast majority of larvae, these beautiful butterflies, feed on native tree and shrub leaves. The larvae of some butterfly species feed on wildflowers and grass leaves and, and other plants. Here's a great spangled frilly butterfly that was collecting nectar from a butterfly milkweed. Uh, this one I mentioned last time, and I mentioned it earlier. This particular butterfly won't exist if there aren't any of those uh, purple uh, you know, uh, violets that people detest in their lawns and use herbicide to get rid of. I think that's a pretty neat butterfly, actually. Here are some of the insect caterpillars. With the, the monarch, of course, is just on milkweeds, but these others require, uh, you know, trees and shrubs and and other native plants in order to survive. And they some are not real specific about what they feed on. Most of them have to have certain plants. And as I said, oaks support more of them than as species of them than any other kind of plant for butterflies and moths. So how do you do this on an edge? Well, first, you've got to inventory your existing layers. You know, what edge layers already exist in your yard? What needs to be removed? Where do you want shade? Is a privacy screen a priority? Do you not want to be able to see your neighbor's yard? Fine. Uh, and that a lot of people don't. Uh, and this can be done with plants rather than putting up fencing. Uh, where do we want to place the boot woody border? Next, inventory. You, oh, let's see. I hit the wrong button. Draw a home landscape map like Effie showed us last week. Uh, see what's there. Think about the future. Make plans. They'll all change. It won't look, it won't end up the way you make the map, but with a map you have a, a, a way to start. Outline the woody border with a garden hose. Nature does not grow in straight lines. It's much more aesthetically pleasing to have a curved, interesting edge. Develop an implementation, implementation calendar. And I, what I have last, I put in there with a little fear and trembling. Is, uh, first of all, uh, plant canopy trees, understory trees, and shrubs at the same time if possible. Uh, the herbaceous layer may be planted later, However, don't forget that, the part with the wildflowers and grasses, which most people do. If you want to have lots of butterflies and so on, 
you need that layer. And they can be really add enjoyment to life. And they help life. Canopy trees. Uh, let's talk for just a moment about oaks. They are amazing. For example, what vital free ecological services or things we get for free are provided by our wonderful native oak trees here in Iowa? Now, the list is pretty long, and I'll go pretty fast, but it's pretty amazing. They produce oxygen, they purify the air, they provide lumber, they increase property value, they store carbon, which stabilizes the climate, they reduce soil erosion, they absorb water, which reduces flooding, they provide cover for wildlife, they supply nesting sites for birds, they provide food for insect caterpillars that songbirds feed to their young, uh, they grow acorns, they're important food for mammals and wild turkeys, uh, but they don't produce them every year. Uh, a lot of people go, I don't want an oak in my yard, it's going to make this mess. Well, not. it only happens every f several years. It doesn't happen every year. Uh, they provide shade and cooling for our homes and yards. They support wildlife populations for hunting and they inspire us while hiking, bird watching, and camping. We must plant, replant many negative oaks on our property since many of them around Grinnell and in Powasheet County are old and very little oak reproduction is occurring because of deer, uh, which we have a lot of. Our oaks are keystone plants without which much of our Iowa wildlife would disappear. All native plants provide many free ecosystem services, things we get for free that cost money otherwise, that enrich our lives. And we don't notice those until we don't have them. Uh, the most common one in this area is Baroque. You know, South Grinnell, there are, a lot of, there are quite a number of Baroque groves, and there is one on our property, and, and a... a uh, nine acre oak hickory timber with mainly bur oak in it. One of the problems with bur oak is it is susceptible to oak blight. Uh, some of them are dying uh, gradually uh, and our state fo uh, a state forester who I know pretty well, Mark Vitosh, who's on the Hort Show pretty frequently, uh, is uh, a, uh, he recommends that you plant a variety of oaks, not just one species. With ash trees, you'd think we'd get, we'd catch on. You know, we lost our elms, so we planted a lot of ash trees, and now another disease comes along, and we've lost, we're pretty much have been, our ash trees have been wiped out. Uh, notice that if uh, you can probably see it here, there are holes in these leaves here and there. There are places that insect larvae have been busy feeding on them. Uh, northern red oak, uh, white oak is a possibility. I don't have that in my slides, uh, except for this particular species of white oak. Swamp white oak is a great uh, a yard uh, tree, and you'll notice the edge of the leaves are have been chomped on by insect caterpillars in places. Uh, now, Mark Vitosh recommends chinkamon oak. That's one he said, I need, you need to plant this on your property. You need a variety of oaks. Uh, black cherries. Wild black cherries are fairly tall trees when they're mature, and they produce uh, food for birds, and they, the birds will line up to get those cherries. Uh, and if you look closely in some places on the lower left-hand corner, there are lots of holes in those leaves. They support quite a few different species of insect caterpillars that the birds use. Now, does this, dis, do the birds take, destroy all of our butterflies and moths? Absolutely not, they don't get all of them. So there are plenty of butterflies and moths left over when they get done feeding their babies. Uh, here's another one, cottonwood. Again, get, make sure you get a male tree. You don't want all that cotton in your yard. 
Uh, that's a pretty big tree most yard, for most yards, however. Uh, shade bark hickory, again, they don't produce hickory nuts every year, and they won't produce them for quite a while when you first plant them. Uh, here's another one, basswood. Again, you can see holes in the leaves, and they didn't get there without, in, without insect larvae, uh, butterfly and moth larvae feeding on those, and other insects for that matter. Walnut. Uh, yeah, they do produce walnuts pretty much every year unless you get a really unusual year, and that can be an issue in a yard. It's, it's up to you, and they are very big trees. Hackberry is another one, and it can be an understory tree. It can also get really big. Uh, understory trees. Uh, choke cherries are incredible. <laughs> I, I have seen birds literally line up like they were in a grocery store, check out to get, the, uh, to get those, and they are great for pollinators for a little bit during the year. Uh, red slippery elm uh, is a possibility. I, Dutch elm disease eventually might get to this. Uh, Coxpur hawthorn is a great place, is a great tree for nesting birds. It's fairly short, has lots of lots of uh, stickers in it, and the predators can't get inside to the nests. So they often really love hawthorns. And we, uh, we have several on our property, and the birds flock to those. And, of course, pollinators, because they're, they're native trees that uh, our pollinators are adapted to. Fruit trees may be part of an understory setting. Uh, I, there was a question about ground cover last time, and Amy, our county naturalist, asked me about that, and I, I sent her some suggestions by email uh, but uh, a couple days ago. But uh, Virginia creeper will climb up trees. A lot of people think it's poison ivy. It has five leaves, not three. Uh, and it is a good ground cover. Uh, it uh, does really well in semi-shade, and it's uh, a fairly attractive plant. And, and like I say, it shades the ground. Pandora sphinx moth larva, and some people go, oh, that's kind of cool, and others will go, oh, my goodness. Uh, feed only on Virginia creeper. And... Whether you like this one or not, you probably don't like the uh, insect in the next picture. It's adult version. This is a hummingbird moth. That's what most people call them. A Pandora sphinx moth. One of the moths, it isn't that big, <laughs> but uh, that's one of the moths that hovers over flowers in the fall, just like a hummingbird does. And again, those won't exist without Virginia creeper being present. That's all that the larvae ever eat. That's where they lay their eggs. That's why we need a diverse habitat with a variety of native plants in it. And, and you know, this is one of the plants that can be planted in the shade. Shrub layer. And you go, oh, you're doing that again. Well, a lot of people ignore the shrubs, or they put in non-native shrubs. That's why I'm repeating these. Hazelnut. It's a native shrub and it's very attractive. Very, it's great for various kinds of desirable wildlife. A service berry, again, nice blooms, gorgeous plant, uh, gorgeous shrub, and it helps pollinators. Uh, nanny berry is another one that I, you know, most of these I showed before. Uh, red Aussie or dogwood actually isn't native to this exact county, but uh, it's really nice and the stems are red when the leaves go off in the fall. So they're really attractive. Uh, wild plum. Now this is the, on the, f out by the road on the front fence row on our place. And uh, in the spring, it is for about a week and a half, it is absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. 
with these blooms and the pollinators. This is one of the plants that pollinators really need in the spring. Uh, they do spread underground, but if you're in a, in a yard setting and you're mowing, it's not going to be an issue. Uh, they are very attractive to songbirds and great cover for songbirds when they're resting in the shade. And, of course, the plums are good to eat for songbirds and people. Okay, now I'm not the big expert on planting trees, but uh, here, here we go. Uh, this is one suggestion. Use two flexible ties when staking and uh, keep the tree from getting, you know, bent over when it's really young. Uh, gently backfill using water to settle the soil around the root ball, set the ball on firmly packed soil to prevent uh, I'm watching the time a little bit uh, because I want to leave time for questions. Uh, settling. Uh, cut burlap and rope away from the top third of the root ball. Now this uh, neck and put into a, a two to four inch layer of mulch. I recommend four inches actually. Uh, Mark Vitosh uh, tells me has told me you've got to get everything cleared out under that tree so that you don't have competition uh, from grasses and other stuff that's going to take up water you do have to water it don't put the mulch up against the base of the tree leave some room for it to breathe there and that's basically it for that slide mulch with compost leaf litter or shredded uh, wood mulch, herbaceous layer. So this is the part that gets left out. And you've seen some of these before, because I talked about putting, taking a tree that's in the middle of the yard and putting a butterfly garden in, the, you know, in the inside of the drip line of that tree where it's going to be in the shade part of the day. So the herbaceous layer, and this needs to be there if, if you're going to have lots of songbirds and you're going to have lots of pollinators, butterflies, and other insects present, they need all of the layers that are normally in a, in a forest. So these are grasses, sedges, and wildflowers that tolerate partial shade. And I've, I've added one or two that, again, Columbine does great in the shade. It's not a problem. It doesn't spread like crazy there. Don't plant it in the sun. I've had bad experiences with that. A wild leek, again, this leaf comes up fairly early. It will disappear, and, and then they'll, you'll see a, a flowering head, and then that disappears. But it, it has really cool big leaves. Uh, jack in the pulpit, I love jack in the pulpit. Uh, shorts aster in the fall. Wild ginger, and I said before, I love wild ginger. It's a beautiful plant because it has these really interesting leaves. Uh, May apple, I would plant it pretty sparingly. It will, uh, it will spread, and it can take over, but if that's what you want, it's a really good ground cover underneath the uh, trees and shrubs. Uh, oak sedge is a, a woodland sedge. Uh, Long beach sedge works really good. I said that's one of my favorites, and it is. Uh, wild geranium can go both in the sun and in the shade. So can prairie smoke. Bottle brush grass is mainly uh, an edge uh, situation where it gets shade in a portion of the day. Virginia wild rye likes it a little bit darker, a little further in. And it's a good plant. Virginia bluebells, wonderful plants. They do disappear. Once they bloom, the, the, you know, they fade away and then they come up and then they produce seed and you'll see them the next year. Foxglove beard tongue is very adaptable to shade and sun both. Jacob's ladder needs shade. Uh, don't forget the common blue violets. This is one I... 
I didn't put a lot of the tall plants in this list because people get irritated. You know, if they see something really tall, they get, oh my gosh, it's too tall in town. That's such a big deal to some people. So I've included plants that are mostly two foot or shorter in this presentation. This one is taller, but it is absolutely drop dead gorgeous. It has a very almost, I call it ethereal bloom. Uh, lots of bloom, it's really pretty. Uh, it gets up to four foot tall, but it's a really nice plant. I love, I love it, Joe Pieweed. Uh, you have to protect woody plants from rabbits, deer, and rodents. This is Mark Vitosh's solution to that, which he sent me. He came out and did a, a on our property and did a bit of a study. And he said to use a five or six foot tall, a five or six foot tall wire cage. This is woven wire and I can't find woven wire. Uh, it's, that's that height. Most of it's four foot tall. Uh, that's three foot in diameter. It takes a little under eight foot of fencing per cage. Uh, you mulch around the tree and you set it up so you can, you know, lift that up. It's going to take a couple of steel posts, remove all the grass and weed competition around the tree. Uh, and Mark says tree planting should be done between March 15th and May 15th. That, that's the best time. But you're going to have to water this for the first couple of years. And then a drought, maybe longer than that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go through a handout that I handed, that I gave people last time and explain it. Oh, by the way, I take the Newton paper because I taught there for so long and I want to keep track of what's going on in Newton and what the kids are up to and so on because I still substitute teach in Newton and Grinnell. And I take the Grinnell paper. This was last week. I pulled the paper out and I clipped these. Here's one in the Newton uh, spring home and garden section. Uh, create your own native plant garden. And when I started giving talks like this 10 years ago, that kind of article did not exist. And here's another from the Grinnell paper. Monarch conservation efforts essential after low winter count. Yeah, monarchs didn't fare very well last year for some reason. And I, I, the drought is hard, uh, droughts are hard on some of these butterflies. Um, here are some resources, and you can find these online, and then actually on the handout, but uh, we'll get to that later. I'll go over it. Uh, I have this resource, Prairie Moon Nursery. This is their uh, spring catalog. And this is uh, their winter catalog. And, and they're a really good resource, but there are other places that are closer that you can get to. Get that kind of material and information. Now, I'm going to go through the handout that I gave out last time. Are there people here that weren't here last time? Okay. If you weren't here last time, um, keep your hand out. Would you help hand those out? This is the what I'm going to go through right now. And it's about how to plant, plan, plant, and manage an ex a publicly acceptable butterfly garden in an urban setting. So I, I'm going to go through in detail some of this information. It's a bit different than planting a regular garden. There are some a lot of similarities, but some differences. Obviously, locate an appropriate spot for your garden. If you want to plant in the shade, the shade-loving plants, have a butterfly garden in the shade, that's a possibility, or in the sun, or in partial shade, which uh, determines what plants you use. Second, uh, strategies to create a positive public perception. 
Before planting, consider public perception of your native plant garden before you begin. Discuss your native plant garden project with your neighbors before you start. Careful selection of attractive native wildflowers and grasses that are mostly two foot or shorter can help to keep the neighbors happy. Design and it helps if it looks like a flower bed. And I'll explain how you can do some of that. Design your bed so that shorter plants are visible on the edge or front, taller plants in the middle or back, just common sense. Short native grasses should be planted on the borders, not in the middle of the garden. It just doesn't work very well. Prepare the area for planting by removing existing vegetation. I already meant, mentioned solarization. You can use cardboard. You can use herbicides. You can do it in a whole variety of ways. After planting, I had a problem with, for a while, at the Newton High School uh, Butterfly Garden, a uh, superintendent came in from Texas, and he was used to short stuff, and he uh, really got upset that the Butterfly Garden was so tall in front around the flagpole. And he'd gotten some complaints from a few people. This is what I did. I talked to my, actually talked to my friend. What time is it? I only have two minutes. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I won't go through this. I do want to point out something else. I, I went slower than I thought I would. Okay. Um, the handouts that you got today has a list of plants for the Green Yard Makeover on the front. It has a list of plant suppliers for native plants on the back. It also tells about the Warren County Conservation Center plant sale, which is usually on the third Saturday in May from 8 a.m. to noon. Now, I know there are other plant sales that have native plants. This is a really good one. I almost hesitate to say anything because it's gotten pretty popular. Uh, and it's at the Annette Center, uh, s south of Indianola, close to Lake Aquabi. Uh, but that's some of the information there. So if I have two minutes, let's go with questions. Boy, time goes fast when you're having fun. Uh, you, have not, not uh, you, have, you have not mentioned Black-Eyed Susan. Okay. And I see a lot of that. Okay. Uh, Black-eyed Susan is a good plant. It's an annual, so it has to seed to come back. There's one that I will tell you not to put in a butterfly garden because it will absolutely overwhelm it, and that is the perennial black-eyed Susan. I don't list it. We put some in one planting in front of our house, and I've had to go in and use herbicide to eliminate it because nothing else could grow there, shading everything else out. Now the annual black-eyed Susan's fine, the perennial one, I won't touch it again with a 10-foot pole. It's, it's, it just, that's all you have. And I didn't know that. Uh, you know, I, there's a quote that I like from Barry Commoner, nature knows best. Doing this kind of thing is pretty humbling. I've been at it since the mid-70s, 1970s, and I still am learning. And that's very humbling at times, because sometimes I make mistakes, too. Not as many as I used to. Yes? It's pretty aggressive. Pokeweed, and I'm trying to remember whether it's a native or not. It's a big plant. And it's pretty aggressive. I, in a butterfly garden, I wouldn't put it in there. I bet that Jim will hang around a little oh bit. Oh yeah. If you have questions, and I'll get don't rid hesitate. Of this thing. <laughs> Don't hesitate to come up and ask Jim. Um, thank you so much, Jim, for sharing your expertise in creating gardens with native plantings that discourage pet pests 
and support pollinators and songbirds. We look, yes. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Well, if you have, is this on? If you have ch uh, a church setting or uh, a club or, you know, a garden club or a master gardeners group or whatever that you want me to share at, I'd be more than happy to do that. It's funny. I have spoken more, actually, in some cases in other states through Zoom than I've spoken in Grinnell. So Jim is available for speaking for other uh, 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 groups or um, local community uh, places that you might have. Do contact him. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone next Wednesday, March 27th, when Dr. Josh Sanquist, chair of the biology department at Grinnell College, will present our next course entitled The Art of Baby Making. Art refers to assisted reproductive technology, which can raise questions and can also generate hope. So be sure and come next week. Thank you.